from Lake Region Human Service Center. Glad to have you. Thank you. Chelsea, where are you from? Uh, Grand Forks Vocational Rehabilitation. Ah, well, glad to have you too. Yeah, glad to be here. Dr. Bird, this is Julie. Um, when at noon, you know, when you kick it off, can I just make announcement about CEUs and Absolutely. then you can get going? Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Josie, where are you from? I am from North Dakota. I'm currently a VR counselor um, for Grand Forks. Great, glad to have you. Thank you for joining us. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to our third, is this our third session already? Yes. Of the um, FASD webinars. Uh, my name is Julie Hornteved. I added my email to the chat box. What I wanted to share was um, the Board of Social Work has approved one hour for this training or all the other trainings, if you have went to those as well, for continuing education credits, the Department of Human Services is approved for that already. So keep record of this date and time. If you registered um, through the Google Doc when I sent out the email, 
we have your name that I've provided to the Department of Human Services if that would ever get um, checked or audited. We have that. So if you didn't do that, please send me an email so we can get you into that Excel sheet so the department has your name on there for participating today. Um, otherwise, if you have any follow-up questions for me too, you can email me that and I can get it to Dr. Bird, but there's question and answer at the end of the sessions. Um, otherwise, we were trying to get approval for educators to attend these and the Department of Education said no because they need college courses. Um, and so for now, we only have social work credits available. And um, my email is in the chat, the first message, jhorntivet at nd.gov. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy today. So uh, is this, uh, are the PowerPoints up on your screens? Not mine. Oh, okay. Share screen and how about now? Yes, thank you. Okay. So in our uh, previous uh, webinars, uh, we have talked about uh, uh, the concept of FASD as a developmental disability, uh, looking at the origins of FASD, uh, prenatal alcohol exposure, polysubstance exposure, something about the longitudinal course of the disorder. Uh, we talked about uh, issues around uh, screening, uh, some about diagnosis, looked at prevalence, cost, uh, the, mor the mortality rates for the children, the siblings, and the mothers. And uh, so this time I thought I would provide some uh, conceptual updates on where we're at with FASD. And so uh, as you will recall from the previous uh, talks, and I think this is going to take a while for us to wrap our uh, minds around this concept. FASD is the leading cause of intellectual disability, mental disorders, placement in residential care, placement in juvenile corrections, developmental disabilities, and learning disabilities uh, in the United States, and certainly in uh, North Dakota. So the uh, impact of uh, drinking during pregnancy and the long-term sequela uh, from that uh, are uh, substantial public health uh, problems in our state. Uh, FASD is a, also a leading identifiable cause of placement in foster care, infant and childhood mortality, outpatient mental health services, inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations, special education placement, visual impairments, and impaired adaptive behavior functioning. So the burden on uh, the state of North Dakota, uh, on our publicly funded health systems, on our privately reimbursed health systems through insurance, uh, the uh, typical taxpayer funded organizations, the schools, uh, juvenile corrections, uh, the adult correction systems, developmental disabilities, mental health services, uh, uh, on and on, uh, is uh, uh, just, uh, it's incredible. And one of the uh, projects that we're finishing now is a long-term look at the cost of fetal alcohol spectrum uh, disorders. And uh, this is a sort of a new term. Most of us struggle to conceptualize this, uh, but the uh, costs are going to be in the trillions of dollars uh, for a preventable uh, disorder uh, that until recently, uh, people attended to 
as sort of an optional uh, issue. Well, we might think about that or we might not. Uh, so in FASD, uh, let me get this uh, enlarged here. I wonder why I can't do that. Does anybody know why I can't get this? Oh, here, maybe I need to go to this presentation thing. Magic. Uh, so in FASD, multiple changes are coming. Uh, there is going to be a lot of attention, not only to FASD in its component parts, uh, the prenatal exposures, uh, mothers who are drinking, uh, the uh, infant and neonatal costs of uh, uh, FASD, the kinds of services that are uh, needed, uh, its impact on childhood, adolescence, adult life, and the uh, elderly. So one of the uh, emerging concepts here, uh, we've been studying this for quite a while, and there is uh, astoundingly little data on the role of the men, but there are just two or three things I want to uh, focus on here. Uh, and we've talked about this a little bit before. Men drinking with their uh, men originate drinking with their partner about 40% of the time. Most of the time, uh, partners only drink with their men. Uh, and men drinking during pregnancy decreases birth weight by about the same amount as if the mom smoked. So the role of men in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, is as yet unknown, uh, but it's incorrect to think that the man uh, does not have a significant role uh, in women's drinking during pregnancy and in risk uh, to the fetus. We're spending a lot of time trying to convey this concept uh, to the uh, medical students and others who attend our uh, webinars and training uh, that uh, each episode of drinking, as you can see in that top uh, triangle, uh, is an exposure episode. Uh, so we're interested in helping people understand uh, how much alcohol the mother drank and the duration of exposure, which is uh, how long the bottom part of that graph is. And then uh, we're trying to help people understand that each one of these episodes has to be considered uh, as a part of a cumulative effect. So the effect of alcohol is likely to be quite different uh, if you drank five times during pregnancy as uh, opposed to if you're a daily drinker and you drank uh, say 275 or 80 times. And so these are uh, just basic uh, dosometry uh, parameters that we're trying to help people grasp and uh, begin to think about because I believe this will really change how professionals uh, deal with FASD. Also, uh, as I pointed out earlier in these talks, we really have to become familiar with the concept of risky drinking. Risky drinking starts when you've had six drinks in a week, two times, or when you've had three drinks on a drinking occasion two times. So the concept that uh, a mother's alcohol use has to be of long duration and severe to place the child at risk is incorrect. This new threshold of risky drinking means that we have thousands and thousands of women uh, who are drinking above uh, this level. This is also going to change how we think about FASD. Uh, in the past, we've mostly diagnosed children with uh, pretty significant problems. Uh, you know, they have uh, problems with cognition, vision, motor problems, executive functioning, on and on it goes. Uh, using uh, this new exposure cutoff uh, at this lower level means that we're going to be seeing a lot more children with 
uh, far less severe problems where alcohol is going to uh, come up as the primary etiology for that. And that's going to take uh, people who are providing the diagnosis and intervention a long time to wrap their heads around this. It's going to be a very difficult message for many uh, women who are social drinkers. Uh, and uh, uh, so we're going to have to spend a lot of time uh, preparing uh, people for this, uh, making sure that we increase our messaging around uh, these issues. And just a thought before I move on to the next slide. To date, the messaging has been, uh, uh, has failed. Uh, worldwide in the United States and North Dakota, uh, more women are drinking more women of childbearing age, uh, more pregnant women are drinking. Uh, they're drinking more uh, and the gap between men and women and the amount of alcohol they consume is decreasing rapidly. And this is not because men are drinking less. Worldwide, in virtually every country, more women are drinking and they're drinking more. So the messaging uh, here uh, has to have a dramatic uh, change. Another uh, concept that's uh, going to take us a while to think about is the uh, idea of FASD as a lifespan disorder. And in the elderly, uh, FASD has a presentation or as we call it phenotype uh, and it's chronic illness and sensory impairments, uh, impaired independent living skills. Uh, in adults, FASD has a phenotype. Uh, it's again, chronic illness, sensory impairments, uh, neuropsychiatric impairments, increased mental health, increased substance abuse, and uh, uh, a huge increase uh, in failed relationships. Uh, so as we work our way from the elderly down to infancy or from infancy up to the elderly, uh, we can see this is a lifespan disorder and it looks different uh, in different phases of your uh, life. Uh, this is an example from uh, uh, one of the international conferences uh, on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders at Vancouver from a Canadian pediatrician, Christine Locke. And she's just pointing out that uh, when you look at FASD as an organ system problem, uh, probably the number one uh, problem uh, here uh, is autoimmune difficulties, uh, respiratory problems, uh, et cetera. And of course, I think we're all familiar with the profound impact alcohol has uh, on brain uh, functioning. So uh, for example, congenital heart defects, uh, she's talking here about mostly uh, children who were born with heart defects. We know that drinking alcohol uh, during pregnancy changes the contractility of the individual heart myocytes, the individual cells in the heart. And uh, it appears that they're going to be much uh, more uh, susceptible uh, to uh, uh, adult cardiac conditions where the pumping power of the heart is decreased uh, because those individual cells don't work right. A couple of recent publications on skeletal abnormalities showing that the long bones in your legs and your arms are increasing, uh, are susceptible to breakage because of prenatal alcohol exposure. Uh, and as I mentioned last time, uh, there's a great uh, uh, paper coming out uh, on uh, screening for FASD using uh, visual findings. So slowly but surely, we're beginning to see the FASD ship turn so that people are settling into this idea of a lifespan disorder. FASD looks different across the different developmental phases of life. And uh, uh, 
it uh, persists uh, certainly through childhood, adolescence, and young adult life, uh, becomes progressively more complex. I don't really know if that continues through uh, middle age and uh, for the elderly or not. Lastly, uh, uh, one thought on uh, the uh, impact of FASD in the elderly, and I think I touched on this before, uh, the current study, and I believe there's only one of any substance, shows that in people with FASD, the risk for dementia uh, is increased over a hundredfold. And this isn't dementia in the elderly, this is early onset dementia, uh, beginning uh, during uh, adult life, uh, not in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, but before that. Uh, we're uh, implementing a study right now uh, to see if we can confirm that, uh, and that'll be some years before that's done. But uh, if that's true, that's a very troubling uh, concern. The consequences of this, uh, as we go forward, uh, I think it's going to be common that all delivery hospitals are going to need uh, some people on staff with expertise in substance use, substance abuse. Uh, at all uh, delivery hospitals, rather than just doing the testing, announcing to somebody that this child has a, a newborn uh, test uh, that was positive for opioids, methamphetamine, uh, et cetera, uh, that we actually do something about it. Uh, we uh, need to prioritize development of these teams in hospitals uh, uh, where the mother or the child are likely to spend a longer period of, period of time. Uh, I have quite a few children uh, that I see who have spent uh, uh, six, 10 weeks uh, in the NICU, uh, which would have been ideal time for the hospital in the NICU team uh, to develop a substance abuse treatment program for the mother and get it started as a part of the healthcare system for that baby and their family. Uh, I think also we're going to see uh, a great need, I, I think this is true in North Dakota already, uh, to identify these children and to provide substance abuse consultation support uh, inclusion of some kind uh, in our early uh, intervention services, uh, uh, birth through uh, three. The rationale for that, very straightforward. Uh, FASD uh, is more likely in younger siblings. So the next birth is more likely than the current one to have FASD. Uh, and the younger children in these sib ships and the families tend to be more severely affected than the older children. So there's every reason to think uh, that early intervention is going to be an important place to identify problems with substance use, especially alcohol, and uh, to try to uh, look at that as one additional option uh, for people to offer some intervention uh, to the mothers. As uh, we have talked about in the past, the cost of FASD is just staggering. Uh, on the Grand Forks, on the front page of the Grand Forks Herald, over the past two or three years, I have seen numerable, uh, numerous uh, headlines about the opioid epidemic. Uh, and how much it's increased. But opioids are not of the same magnitude of a problem in North Dakota as alcohol. And the costs of alcohol dwarf uh, those of uh, opioid disorders. Yet when you read the newspaper, you would think that opioids are really the only substance abuse problem that we have. I just want to point out a couple of, uh, couple of things, and we've gone over these before, but they really bear repeating. If we look at Medicaid covered uh, families, uh, the cost per person with FASD 
is greater is 496 percent greater. So it costs five times more to take care of a person with FASD than it does somebody who does not have FASD. This is important uh, uh, for a bunch of reasons, but one is to alert hospitals, clinics, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, uh, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, psychologists, substance abuse treatment providers, social workers, uh, that FASD is common. And what they're treating uh, uh, should be screened for the presence of FASD. As most of you know, costs for private health insurance are higher than those for uh, uh, medical assistance or Medicaid. And uh, for private health insurance, it costs 7.2 times more to pay for somebody uh, with FASD compared to somebody who does not have FASD. I think it goes without saying, uh, and we've talked about this, that a substantial number of these costs uh, are incurred early in life with these long uh, neonatal uh, intensive unit stays and uh, later in childhood and adolescence uh, when we see these dramatic increases uh, in outpatient mental health services, inpatient mental health services, residential care uh, placements. Uh, <clears throat> several states now, uh, Maryland and Florida, for example, uh, have decided that uh, they want to begin to approach FASD uh, through early identification and early uh, intervention. And uh, this uh, painting uh, was given to me by uh, a tribal nation where I was doing some consultation. And the artist had formulated a concept uh, of uh, some of the problems on their uh, particular tribal nation. And uh, this is uh, absolutely not exclusive to tribal nations. It could just as easily apply to Bismarck, Grand Forks, Fargo, Jamestown, Carrington, Hedinger, Williston, uh, wherever. So uh, his thinking was that these dark forces, uh, these clouds up here, uh, the uh, stress of society, family disruption, increased use of substance abuse, uh, family breakup, the effects of uh, electronic media, uh, all uh, uh, attack uh, the health of babies. And it's interesting that he drew this picture uh, depicting this damage is taking place in the baby's uh, brain. And he noted that uh, the people uh, standing along the sides are the people who typically would have been involved uh, taking care of these infants, their grandparents, their relatives, the community, uh, but now uh, people are uh, either overwhelmed enough with their own problems uh, or they lack uh, community commitment. Uh, and so uh, they, we have become tolerant of these uh, issues. A really great uh, photograph. And I think his view of this uh, very helpful in conceptualizing uh, the problem of uh, substance exposure during uh, infancy. As you may know, uh, we have spent uh, quite a few years uh, developing these uh, age-based age screening tools. And I have talked before about the tool we use for screening from three years of age and older and uh, some of the component parts of that. So here is the screen uh, that we have developed, been using, uh, if you're familiar with the zero to three uh, program, a national advocacy uh, uh, entity for uh, birth uh, for children uh, from pregnancy through three years of age. Uh, they've had this on their website for some, kind, some time. And I've done uh, a lot of training for them around this. So this is a tool that was developed uh, uh, for ease of use 
uh, in early intervention settings. Uh, social workers can use this. Uh, pediatricians can use this. Uh, early intervention providers can use this. It takes a little bit of training, but it's very straightforward. And as you can see right above the picture there, uh, a score of four or more uh, is considered positive. A uh, score of four uh, in North Dakota is accurate 84% of the time and uh, correctly identifies children who do not have an FASD uh, about 51% of the time. So uh, it does tend to over refer a little bit, uh, which was the purpose of the screen. Uh, but very useful and Groove. could hardly be uh, quicker. This is the uh, ABC uh, uh, screening tool we've talked about before and the areas that uh, this focuses on. Uh, for three through six years, the cutoff is 16. For seven years and older, the cutoff is 20. Uh, this is being used in large, large numbers of uh, uh, states and uh, uh, other countries now. What's the purpose of the early identification? Well, as I have shown before, uh, if we don't have early identification and early intervention, we end up with a huge amount of excess disability in people. And what is excess disability? Well, it's straightforward. It's undiagnosed uh, neuropsychiatric impairments. Uh, it's exposure to adverse childhood experiences, placement in multiple foster homes, uh, educational failure because there's no IEP or no appropriate uh, intervention, and on and on it goes. As children get older, this leads to placement in juvenile corrections, increased rates of substance abuse, and all the things that people I'm sure watching or that are on this webinar today know about. So the concept of excess disability is extremely important because overall it accounts for nearly half of the total disability. So the preventable fraction of disability in FASD is almost 50%. As I'm pretty sure most people are aware of, in FASD, the outcomes from treatment are dependent on the timing and the quality of services. That would be true for breast cancer, leukemia, epilepsy, visual impairment. Uh, and as I think we all know, it's the quality and timing of treatment not trying harder that counts. We've spent many decades urging kids with these developmental impairments to try harder. And I think we need to now begin to help them understand uh, that we need to identify these and accommodate for these impairments. I'm particularly interested because uh, in cooperation with the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Spectrum, on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, uh, we have a series of trainings around the United States for uh, corrections uh, 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 staff. Uh, it's attorneys, uh, public defenders, uh, death penalty attorneys, uh, et cetera, uh, on FASD. And, one of the concepts that we're uh, trying to help people understand is that not only is FASD a developmental impairment, but the biology of FASD is the reason for many of these system uh, failures. And so it uh, goes like this. You can see these uh, images of exposed, uh, I think these are mice that were exposed during pregnancy. Looks the same in people. Uh, the blue shading is areas of cell death from a single exposure to alcohol. And you can look in the bottom right-hand corner there of that graphic and see that section through the brain tissue. And you can see that this is more concentrated in the outer layers 
uh, where the cells are the densest uh, and they're trying to establish uh, connections and network. Uh, this leads, if you look right to the right, to uh, change in how we see these children. We could see them as having behavior problems and impairments, but uh, what we're most interested in is seeing them as less behavior, more impairments. And they have this very inconsistent performance from day to day. On Tuesday, they can do their multiplication facts. Uh, and on Wednesday, they look at those like they have never seen them. Uh, little kids on Monday uh, could write their numbers from one through 10. And on Thursday, uh, barely able to draw a circle. And that's because of failure in uh, these learning modules that are developed in the brain. Uh, so if you look down in the bottom, you can see that uh, these problems persist over the lifespan. It's essentially the same behavior across different ages. Uh, they're irritable, impulsive. Uh, they become poorly organized, can't complete things. Uh, they lose things, forget to bring stuff ho uh, home or take stuff to school. They don't understand well. Uh, they have problems making and maintaining friendships. Uh, as they get older and the demands go up, uh, they can't finish their work. They lose things. They need increasing help every day. And because of the difficulty of doing this work, they become avoidant, aggressive. Uh, by 12, lots of school problems. Uh, problems begin to show up in other settings, uh, and this continues uh, across the lifespan. Uh, and if we look over to the side, we can see how uh, we have depicted this. Uh, everyone is sympathetic to the baby uh, who's undergoing withdrawal, uh, who had prenatal alcohol exposure. Uh, however, it's quite a different story to the 16-year-old uh, who continues to do the same senseless goofball things over and over and over again that land them in trouble with the police. Uh, the same uh, amount of victimization, exploitation by their peers goes on and on. Uh, and people uh, become upset and we assign responsibility for that. And we skip past this brain impairment part uh, and start on this you must be responsible for your actions. One area where we have tremendous potential for prevention here, and we've talked about this before, uh, is the uh, exposure to adverse childhood experiences. Uh, in 50 some years of sitting in a clinic, listening to little children uh, or children of any age, adults for that matter, talk about this. Uh, uh, no one uh, should have to listen to this kind of stuff. Uh, especially uh, when for children with FASD, early identification would be very helpful in preventing this. Uh, these are uh, very serious problems. Exposure to these things, in many cases, uh, we can establish uh, the risk for this uh, by screening during pregnancy and by early identification of FASD and prevent exposure to a substantial number of this kind of stuff uh, over the lifespan of these children. And that would greatly benefit uh, huge numbers of people. The biology of this, I think uh, we can understand like this. Uh, the consequences of alcohol exposure during pregnancy, adverse childhood experiences, and then across the rest of your life, struggling uh, to make your way in society because of these impairments and deficits, this adaptive failure, uh, create networks. Makes sense, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. So if during infancy, early childhood, you're exposed to a lot of stress and violence, the neurons that regulate those systems of care wire together and become strong, durable, functional systems. Uh, 
those systems that respond to uh, care, love, quiet, uh, appropriate attention, being successful, uh, don't wire together and don't fire together. So the biological basis of, of the outcomes here is really well understood. And I think we need to uh, increase our appreciation of this and begin to develop programs uh, which more closely follow uh, the science here, which is uh, in this case, uh, very well worked out. Another example uh, is uh, the uh, child protection services and foster care system. And we've talked about this uh, before, uh, but I just don't think we can talk about it enough. Uh, the foster care system is a substance abuse treatment program. Children are mostly in foster care because of substance use. A very common substance is alcohol. We have this problem where uh, people hear the word methamphetamine and uh, people incorrectly assume uh, that that is the most damaging, worst uh, substance you could be exposed to. But to reiterate again, uh, alcohol is by far the most teratogenic substance during pregnancy. Cigarettes follow. Alcohol and cigarettes are, uh, when they're combined, are even worse. And uh, as most of you know, uh, many heavy drinkers also smoke. So uh, children going into foster care uh, should be routinely screened for prenatal alcohol exposure and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder because this is where most of the kids go. Uh, one of the most common service systems for kids with FASD uh, is the foster care system. So we have to ramp up our attention to this in that system, and it should be an expectation that every child entering that system is screened uh, for prenatal alcohol exposure and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. If you look on the zero to three uh, website, enter the terms fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, you'll see that uh, myself and a couple of other people have prepared uh, some uh, guides for how to do this and the implications of this. But uh, as we just pointed out, we have two screening tools uh, from North Dakota for North Dakota. Uh, perhaps being used in many settings more widely uh, than there are in North Dakota uh, for screening in the child welfare uh, system or the foster care system. The implications of this in foster care are substantial. Uh, as many of you know, uh, one of the things that's come with the COVID is a huge increase in the number of terminations of parental rights. Uh, the demand on services has continued to increase. The available availability of services has substantially decreased and uh, parents uh, are often uh, caught in between and are paying a significant price for this. So uh, not, uh, not uncommonly now, uh, you see a pretty dramatic rise in terminations of parental rights earlier uh, in the course of uh, the foster care placement and uh, with uh, far less intervention than we would normally have demanded. And, and we have, uh, I don't know, probably 50, 70 sites uh, in zero to three of these safe babies court teams, and it's uh, present everywhere. 
I want to turn my attention now to uh, juvenile uh, corrections. Uh, you'll recall uh, we had this uh, PowerPoint, the prenatal exposures, uh, the consequences of that, the behavior persists over the lifespan. At some point, we lose sight of this damage to the fetal brain and want people to just simply get over it, as I call it, the responsibility scale. And it tilts in an alarmingly uh, risky direction uh, for children and their families. So uh, I wrote a, a pretty detailed affidavit on FASD for the National Juvenile Defender Center. We've talked about that a little bit, but I want to reemphasize again what this looks like. So uh, this is problems in socialization, communication, self-care. Uh, very important that people understand this issue of gullibility, naivete, uh, and credulity. Uh, the uh, simple-mindedness of uh, people with FASD at all ages of life. Uh, problems with suggestibility, which uh, are of extreme importance when people with FASD have contact with law enforcement. This is a problem of extreme importance. Uh, confabulation, uh, where uh, people begin to fill in missing parts in their memory. Uh, this is dramatically exacerbated by stress and uh, creates a lot of difficulties uh, when uh, children, adolescents, adults are being interviewed by the uh, police. Uh, I think these are pretty straightforward. Uh, all have significant uh, uh, roles in juvenile corrections settings. Victimization, exploitation, very big in this population, uh, very big. I think it goes without saying, that just because you're 16, it does not give you any control over the drinking habits of your parents. As pointed out so succinctly uh, by the Florida Supreme Court. So we must approach this issue of uh, responsibility for people with FASD cautiously. And I think it will go better uh, if we're informed about how these impairments manifest themselves across the uh, age span. The data is, I think, in on the benefits of screening in juvenile corrections, identification of children with FASD, and implementing a diagnosis-informed approach for children with FASD. I've gone over this before, but I wanna bring this up in the context of this lifespan disorder uh, because uh, pretty uh, convincing evidence uh, that if you identify these children uh, and identification by itself uh, is of little value, it's just another couple sentences in their chart, but identification linked to diagnosis informed services makes a big difference. Identification and use of the same services they were getting before is obviously not going to make much difference. But using a diagnosis of FASD to identify an appropriate service pathway, uh, very helpful. And uh, these uh, results are from two sites. Uh, and I think you'd have a hard time arguing that those are not uh, very beneficial uh, outcomes. I want to turn uh, our attention to some uh, new directions that we might look at uh, to decrease prenatal alcohol exposure uh, based on some services in the Congo. Uh, a couple decades ago, I got a single email and it says, FAS bad in Congo needs helps. 
and I deleted it. Uh, a few months later, I was looking through my deleted box for something else. I saw this and I thought, well, what if that's actually from somebody? So I replied. Uh, it was from a public health nurse in the Congo who had uh, come across some of my work, uh, had written a letter uh, asking for help. And uh, this has been a huge research site uh, for us uh, for nearly 20 years now, and has been a great place uh, to study alcohol use because it is so unbelievably common there. Uh, when we screen for prenatal alcohol exposure on, in routine prenatal care settings, so we had a screening team and we just randomly set up at different sites, uh, we find very uh, high numbers of women who have been drinking during pregnancy. And what's even more interesting is very large numbers of women who have been drinking on the day of their prenatal care visit. We followed that up with a series of breathalyzer studies where we would ask women who uh, had uh, come for a prenatal visit uh, to do a breathalyzer. And uh, we found really amazing results of alcohol use or alcohol exposure. Uh, if you get a positive breathalyzer screen on a prenatal visit, the likelihood of getting a second one goes way up and the likelihood of getting a third one during labor and delivery goes up. So about 25% of these women had a positive breathalyzer screen uh, during labor and delivery. The government of the Congo wanted an intervention program uh, and said that uh, uh, we could do it, uh, but it has to be done for an astoundingly low price. I can't remember what it was, I think it was uh, something like 18 or 20 cents a person. Uh, in the Congo, their annual expenditure on health care per person is $186. We developed a poster, uh, which we hung up in uh, doctor's offices, prenatal care providers, and had these six panels. You point to the picture and literally read the material, which is in French in the Congo. And it says, I'm concerned. Uh, it outlines some of the problems that drinking during pregnancy can cause. Uh, we uh, do uh, uh, essentially a modification of uh, a decisional uh, tree. Why do you drink? Uh, when do you drink? Uh, then we ask, what are the advantages for you to stop drinking? And we offer a panel of suggestions. By far the most important uh, has been to find a friend to help and you bring your friend with you to all subsequent prenatal visits. And it's been a robustly successful intervention uh, and it came in below the government's uh, cost requirements. So I think we are able to do this for 12, 15 cents. Some very, I don't have the data in front of me, but some, uh, remarkably low uh, number, and uh, we get a substantial reduction in prenatal alcohol exposure. Uh, we literally need something this simple in the United States, hanging up in prenatal care providers' offices, literally. When you walk into an ophthalmologist's office, you see that vision screen up on the wall? We literally need something like this on the walls in our prenatal care settings. And perhaps in well child visits as well. Over the past decade or so, uh, our prevention efforts uh, have focused around preventing recurrence. So if you have one child with FASD, we're very interested in finding those mothers and trying to prevent them from having another exposed pregnancy. We've been trying to pilot ways to improve substance abuse treatment for pregnant women 
in the office and uh, have spent a lot of time on that. We have a little card that we hand out. Uh, I think I've uh, shown that here. Uh, that's been, uh, I think, moderately helpful. Uh, one thing that's interesting, when nurses use it, it's quite helpful. Uh, as uh, many of you may or may not know, uh, some time ago, I uh, developed this program called Don't Quit the Quit. Uh, so we know that women uh, who are drinking, smoking, using drugs, about 92% of them completely quit on finding out they're pregnant. Uh, our goal has been to help them maintain maintain uh, quitting smoking, quitting drinking, quitting drug use, uh, or many of them, if they can't quit, have dramatically cut down. And uh, so uh, I consider this evidence that the hard work's already done. We just want them to maintain uh, where they're at. And uh, uh, you cannot overestimate the importance of prenatal screening on reducing alcohol use during pregnancy. Uh, having your doctor prenatal care provider sit down and talk to you about their concerns about alcohol exposure during pregnancy and their commitment to helping you change, uh, almost invaluable. It's less helpful uh, if the emphasis uh, is on uh, getting you to quit drinking, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but identifying this as something they're concerned about uh, and offering you a commitment to help you, uh, very, very useful. The Don't Quit the Quit uh, program looks uh, something like this. It's a five uh, trimester uh, program. Uh, the three months prior to pregnancy, uh, the three uh, trimesters of pregnancy, and the three months after uh, delivery. And uh, pretty good data here. Uh, I uh, uh, can tell you that this uh, uh, seems to be quite a useful approach. Uh, the University of North Dakota College of Nursing uh, has a grant and they're trying uh, they not trying, they are actually implementing this program uh, in uh, pilot sites across North Dakota. Uh, this is something that our fetal alcohol spectrum disorder center is committed to over quite some time. Uh, this don't quit the quit model uh, because this is an opportunity for enormous public health impact with very little cost. The secret, in my opinion, uh, to managing fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, at all points along this continuum is for us to realize that we're going to have to work on this together. Uh, and here's uh, some of the issues around this. Uh, I think this is especially important uh, for parents uh, helping parents understand uh, the need for services, the need for a diagnosis, and uh, how those two things must come together. So I wonder if we have any comments here that we might uh, talk about. Larry? Yes. I have a question. On your presentation, you always are very, um, you stress the difficulties. Uh, what do you say or what do you, uh, what do you believe are the strengths? And the second question in stressing all the difficulties Are these kids um, 
prone to, in the adult population, prone or susceptible to creating a lot of, um, can they, can they cause harm to other people a lot? So, uh, there are a lot of people who talk about FASD in the context of strengths. And I think that's important uh, for parents and service delivery systems uh, to uh, look at these children, uh, adolescents, adults, and to identify uh, factors uh, leading, promoting, supporting resiliency. Uh, however, uh, I don't think we're at the point in FASD where there's anywhere near enough understanding of the unbelievable prevalence of this, uh, the severity of it, the enormity of the cost uh, that uh, the primary focus should be on strengths resiliency. So as a general rule, uh, these children uh, are uh, mostly enjoyable. Uh, they have a fairly charming personality in many cases. Uh, if you uh, are in the right setting, uh, they're pleasant. Uh, to spend time with, uh, and uh, they have a lot of spontaneity. Uh, the problem is uh, that uh, because of the way their brain functions, uh, they have many, many episodes of extremely poor judgment. Uh, they're very impulsive. And as they get, uh, well, as they cross through certain uh, developmental time periods, uh, they have a lot of difficulty with uh, uh, behavior regulation, particular manage, particularly management of their temper. Uh, so uh, are they capable of harming people? Yes. Uh, is it common? I don't think so. I think it's pretty common during childhood uh, that before they uh, get an evaluation before they get to see us, uh, that their aggression can become very difficult. Uh, they have a lot of communication problems. Uh, they have difficulty comprehending. Uh, and when they become stressed, they tend to become agitated and uh, aggressive. Uh, in juvenile corrections, uh, well, let me rephrase that. In adolescence, uh, the most common problems are people who don't understand uh, uh, these uh, episodes uh, leading to aggression. And uh, as a general rule, uh, people don't know when they start. They haven't spent time learning what triggers these things the importance of not persisting in escalating one of these ep episodes when it occurs and how to manage uh, these episodes. So uh, quite a bit of the aggression in schools, in juvenile corrections settings, in residential care uh, settings uh, comes uh, from people's inability to recognize when this child no longer uh, is able to regulate their behavior. And uh, when that happens, uh, if people haven't had training, if they don't uh, understand this, they can, they tend to keep talking, uh, keep stating requirements, which uh, escalates the problem. So when these episodes start, uh, what we have to do is we have to quit talking because if talking worked, we would not be in this situation at all. We would not be here if talking worked. And uh, we have to get some distance between us and wait for things to settle down a little bit. If you do that early in the episode, 
then it doesn't take that long. Uh, if you wait till somebody's screaming, raging around, throwing chairs, kicking holes in the walls, uh, that's going to take a while. Uh, I foresee a tremendous contribution from the field of applied behavior analysis uh, to managing this uh, with uh, these crisis management teams that are very uh, becoming very popular uh, so that we don't have to get the police involved. Uh, in most cases, these crisis management people uh, are able to defuse these situations uh, so we don't need the police, uh, which is a tremendous uh, benefit uh, for everybody involved. Uh, and uh, if we can, uh, hopefully the crisis management people can then follow up with a visit to this family uh, over how to prevent getting into this situation. Uh, and we see a substantial reduction uh, in the uh, future frequency of these problems. Did that answer your question or did I just avoid it? No, it, it helped tremendously to kind of determine the need for knowledge and awareness of the disorder, which I work a lot in North Texas on education of mental health, the schools, foster care parents and the systems. So thank you. Very, just uh, two follow up comments. Very often the schools have the right program uh, sketched out uh, and it's implemented in completely the wrong way. Uh, they'll often have an IEP behavior plan uh, written so that when escalation starts, we're going to do this. And uh, then when you uh, observe what's happening, uh, uh, they're talking to this child the entire time. Uh, they're talking to them when they're already mad. Uh, they're following them down the hallway to uh, the room where they're going to go and settle down. Uh, they follow them into the room talking, and uh, they are uh, often just repeating things that are guaranteed to escalate this behavior. Uh, and I've heard this many times. Uh, I don't know how many times we're going to have to do this. Why can't you just settle in your seat and uh, act like the other kids? Over and over again, you keep doing this. I just don't understand why you keep doing it. And they, uh, so the however much difficulty the child had initially, when they signaled that they needed a pause, and we typically set this up so that either the teacher initiates this or the child, and the instructions are clear. When either one of them indicates this, we are done talking. We know talking is not going to be helpful. It's just provocation. Uh, so it's a, uh, I don't know if that's actually specific to FISD or not. But the second comment is the future of applied behavior analysis is enormous in FASD. Insight oriented psychotherapies, uh, not that helpful. Cognitive behavior therapies uh, possibly are, but for individual problems only. Uh, and we have to have some constraints on our expectations. Uh, applied behavior analysis uh, is going to be an area of tremendous benefit. Great question, thank you. Other questions? Anybody on from that does early intervention? I've done EI. I did a EI for 38 years. I'm only doing right track screening right now, which is birth to three. Tell me, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, how we might look at adding 
some additional training on substance use, uh, perhaps some motivational interviewing. Uh, uh, I think um, we, I know we, we had uh, the nurse come about three years ago, come and talk to our entire program. Um, a lot of the interviewing is done uh, initially now um, by the team that does the assessment and early intervention and or by the DD program managers throughout the state in North Dakota. So it would just be, you know, encouraging them to add a question or two to their questionnaire as they go through it with the family. Yes, I think I think it's not going to take a lot of effort on that end. Uh, and the most important part of this, at least my vision is that uh, you guys, uh, it, it seems pretty clear, right? Uh, that you guys spend more time actually in the house than any other professional. Would that be true? Yes, outside of uh, COVID, um, all of our visits and, and in right track screenings as well, all of our visits are done in the home with the parent. Yes. So not only are you in the right place at the right time, you are with the right person. And I dare say that a huge majority of your visits, uh, you encounter moms more than dads. Would that be true? Yes, the majority of visits we do, sometimes grandparents, sometimes foster care parents, sometimes daycare providers, but I would say the majority of time it is with the parent. Right, so we have opportunity. We got the right people in the right place with the right person. And now we need to figure out how we can help uh, get this set up so that uh, everybody can get comfortable with the idea that this mom uh, might be having some substance use problems and what would be a meaningful role? How could we do that without creating problems? How can, how can we help? So if you have some thoughts on that, I'd be very interested in hearing them. Um, someone put in the chat session as far as the head person right now at DD uh, in the state to con in early intervention a contact with regards to maybe setting up something, um, Dr. Bird, with regards to that. Otherwise, it just takes a good early interventionist um, to be aware of the signs and follow up directly with the parents. I know I've been Many times I've had parents uh, in a alcoholic addiction, uh, is having alcoholism or addiction issues where I've tried to help establish some kind of services for the parent as well as the child. So it just depends on, and sometimes social services is in, involved and uh, within the foster children and that, um, also can play a part in assistance as well. Right, I think, uh, I think it's, it's clear uh, that the foster care systems uh, are going to increase their involvement with this uh, because as we train more and more attorneys uh, and more and more judges are going to be asking on a routine basis, uh, has this person been screened for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? And uh, the attorneys uh, on uh, both for the state and for the parents uh, are going uh, to be thinking about this more. Uh, we're doing several statewide trainings for guardian ad litems coming up uh, on this. So there's going to be increased attention to this. Uh, in those settings, but before foster care, uh, 
I think that's the value of your program. You guys are actually in the home with the mom, which is the magic that we need. You don't have to do it all, but just uh, every time we can add an option uh, for people to get help, I just think it's tremendously beneficial. Other people that have thoughts on this or related issues? I think uh, uh, I may have mentioned this before too. Many states now are going to be revisiting the issue of uh, uh, a mandatory screening for children going into residential care. And uh, FASD is a very uh, big driver of placement in residential care. So we need to dramatically improve uh, our screening efforts for that population and then following up with some way to get them access to uh, diagnosis. And uh, in residential care, it is extremely, and I use that word extremely, difficult uh, to get a residential care facility to change their treatment uh, in a substantial way. So that's going to be a challenging area. Other comments people would like to bring up. Any parents on here that might like to offer some thoughts? Anybody with FASD that might have some thoughts? I can offer some thoughts from the parent regard. Our son just turned 31. He was diagnosed at age 16. And boy, we wish we could get him employed on a more regular basis. It's just so tough because he doesn't acknowledge his FASD. And um, so we are financially, we're the state, we're financially supporting him. Um, and the only way I see out of it is this bill that is, uh, that we have in the works to offer services to get FASD as part of the education system and idea. I, uh, I, I think we have to start, like you say, uh, when they are younger and get them identified early. So uh, Lynn, one of the changes in our cost estimates. Uh, so when we estimate the annual cost for people with FASD, uh, we do it for North Dakota, for the United States, and then the global costs. Uh, and uh, we don't have uh, very useful information for the global cost, but in North Dakota and uh, for the United States. Uh, our uh, current estimate is that it, if you if parents look at the amount of money they spend uh, not taking promotions, using their vacation time, fixing their house, you know, all these unreimbursed costs that go into taking care of somebody with FASD comes out to be about $21,000 a year. Uh, and uh, we do that with a cost diary system. Uh, so I think the estimates are pretty good. What would you, what would you say to that cost in your experience? The cost of supporting him, you mean? Yeah. Oh, I want to cry because what you're saying is exactly what happened. I went from full-time work with the government to part-time, took summers off. Um, tr the money we spent with therapists and the money we're spending today because his best therapist doesn't take any insurance, but she's worth it. 
is tremendous. I, Do you I, think it would exceed 21,000 a year? Oh gosh, yes, yes. So Lynn, first, let me just say, wow, what a great thing you're doing. Uh, second uh, is that uh, the implications of this uh, often aren't clear. Uh, so FASD is strongly associated with people uh, who are not in the middle class or upper class. And my contention has long been uh, that you can start off life as a pretty middle class person. You get a child or two with FASD and uh, uh, you're not going to be able to maintain that kind of life. Mm -hmm. Has that been your experience? Um, <laughs> um, in a way, yes, yes, in a way, yes. We've been fortunate to have the financial means in some respect and to maintain those. Yeah. But it's been a lot, but we can't go on vacations like we want. Um, we bought his house, we're financially supporting him and, um, and a lot of financial and emotional drain. So not to get too personal or pry into your business. Uh, if you uh, looked forward 10 years and 20 years, what do you see? Oh, interesting. I see him as in his same place where he is. Uh, we bought his house in a place that he can afford to live um, I don't see him working. I see him just being isolated and lonely and living in his house, watching TV and playing games. How, how will he keep his house after you're gone? Uh, we have the funds to do a trust and have somebody manage it. Wow. That is fantastic. Any, uh, any other uh, thoughts that you might like to share with people about this problem? If, if you're talking, Lynn, I can't hear you, but uh, uh, anyone else that has any thoughts they might like to share with us uh, might be informative. Dr. Bird, I have a question. Do you notice that the there's a high prevalence of um, Diagnoses being, uh, well, being diagnosed with people who are Native American. Sorry, can't get my words out today, but I hope we, you got my question. Yes, it, the question is, is the prevalence rate of FASD higher in Native Americans uh, than uh, not? Uh, so, this isn't the greatest data we have, uh, but uh, for a while, uh, the highest rate of FASD in uh, North Dakota were in uh, not uh, two of our larger cities, but two of our moderately sized cities in North Dakota. And they had very high numbers of people. Interestingly enough, they would come, we would diagnose them uh, they would go back and uh, uh, there was not one indication that anything changed based on the diagnosis. Uh, in one 
uh, community, there was a mom there who had 11 uh, children with FASD and a couple more who each had three or four. And that was a, just a typical North Dakota uh, community. Uh, so I think one of the reasons that the prevalence rates of FASD have tended to be higher, and I may have said this before, is that early on, many of the tribal elders uh, heard about this and saw this as a tremendous threat to their existence, to the existence of their tribe. And uh, I've been to quite a number of places uh, where the tribal elders are uh, just extremely worried uh, about the effects of uh, substance use and quite a number of them, interestingly enough, have worked out uh, that it's not methamphetamine that's uh, our, our danger, uh, it's alcohol. Uh, and uh, I've talked to a number of tribal elders uh, who have thought this through for many, many years and uh, have, based on their experience, uh, determined that alcohol is the worst drug there is. Uh, now, not in any way to minimize the disastrous implications of methamphetamine or opioids or the other drugs. Uh, I don't want to minimize that at all. So uh, one, one, one other way to think about that, just based on population, the largest number of cases of FASD in North Dakota clearly is going to be Fargo. It's the biggest city. Uh, the prevalence rates aren't less in Fargo than they are anywhere else. Uh, so there's a lot of cases there. Grand Forks, Bismarck, Minot, Jamestown, Dickinson, Wellston, on and on it goes. Uh, all of these communities have cases of FASD and all of them have mostly unrecognized, undiagnosed cases with FASD. Larry, I have another question since I've recovered most of my emotions. Um, we appreciate you so much for sharing with us. Certainly. Uh, you had mentioned the uh, benefit of ABA. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on the Facebook pages about the value of it. And it's generally thought that ABA is not that effective for the kids with an FASD. But you seem to think that it can be or will be. Can you expand on that? Yes. That's a great question. I'm glad you gave me a forum to share my thinking on this. So if I said we're going to do ABA uh, for blindness, would it be effective? No, it would not. Would ABA be effective for liver damage? Almost certainly not. Would ABA cure brain damage? Well, no, it won't. So it depends on the expectation. Now, would ABA be very useful in helping people understand uh, these, uh, the phenomenology of these episodes uh, where somebody gets agitated, starts running around, kicking holes to the wall, throwing stuff, screaming and hollering, which uh, in some families happens two or three times a day? Nothing could be more useful. Understanding how those things start is the key to preventing at least half of them. And if you gave those families an opportunity to get a prescription for a medicine that would bring a 50% reduction in those episodes, uh, they would be beside themselves with joy. Uh, where ABA uh, gets confused 
is as a long-term treatment for problems with memory, impulsivity, attention, comprehension, uh, because uh, those are manifestations of damage to the brain. Uh, and ABA is probably not going to be much more effective than medicines or cognitive behavior therapy, those kind of things for that stuff. But for children who are having repeated episodes of uh, explosive behavior at school, at home, children who uh, are hoarding food, waking up during the night, can't get to sleep, uh, behaviors like that. ABA, uh, not a cure-all, but can be extremely helpful. So I think it's a matter of setting our sights on the right goal. Thank you for that, very good. Four minutes left, any other questions? Lynn, that's great. You should be a co-presenter here. You bring so much to this discussion, wow. Thank you. Other uh, comments or questions? So uh, our final episode, August 12th, 12 o'clock, uh, I think we'll uh, discuss uh, some of the uh, longer term implications of FASD uh, for adults, elderly, and uh, what we're going to have to do to develop programs oriented uh, in that direction. Uh, issues like what comes after you graduate from school, getting a job, how to train uh, the people who help develop work skills, what we're going to do around improving self-care skills and risk reduction uh, issues around um, vulnerability, exploitation, and then it's uh, pretty clear, I think, that uh, we need to have at least a brief discussion uh, on uh, lifelong services uh, uh, for uh, folks with this problem, just to kind of set the stage for this. Everybody knows, everybody knows the Cadillac of services is developmental disabilities eligibility. It's the star everyone wants to reach for. And the reason for that is crystal clear, because if you are eligible for DD services, you got a massive provider on board and you're going to get the optimal outcome possible for your child or an adult. Uh, as I often say, when people get enrolled in DD, we lose track of them because they disappear. And they don't disappear for a negative reason. They disappear because by and large, they are doing well. And we somehow have to reflect the, the important reality that developmental disabilities has the magic for people with FASD. Uh, the adult mental health system, the adult correction system, the adult substance abuse treatment system, not so much. Thank you guys so much. Uh, appreciate you, you taking time to join us.
Lynn? Yes. I sent you a message. Did you get it? I did. And I responded, okay. I'll reach out to you. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Yes, you too. Bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye.